Welcome, everybody. Michael Brooks Show Sunday Economic Series. Check out our conversation last Sunday with Grace Blakely and check out everything we do by going to patreon.com slash TMDS. Of course, if you haven't yet, hit the subscribe button, hit like while you're watching it. You know all the things to do. Joining us now is friend of show and professor of economics and international political economy at Brown University at the Watson Institute. Mark Blythe. Mark, how are you doing? No, I, I'm doing as well as anybody else is in lockdown at this moment. I was fine yeah. last week, and then it just began to get to me. You know, when you're just beginning to feel it, you're just like, okay, there's no, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's just tunnel. Yeah. Well, what is your sense? I mean, do, do you – what is your kind of if, – if you had to – do you have any sense of when some type of kind of rolling reopen could happen? I do, and it's kind of scary because I want to throw something else into the conversation. Yes. Which is when you put businesses and people's behaviors in the freezer for a month, that's fine. We can all go on vacation for a month, right? Even if you're, if you're German, you can go on vacation for six weeks. Remember that stuff, right? <laughs> but once you start to get into sort of like two, three months or even longer, then it's not clear that a lot of these things are going to come back. Things have shifted. Also, our behavior shift. So there's a really interesting bit of data out of China. So it was an area, it wasn't Wuhan, it was one of the ones that was less hip, far less hip, right? Close down, open up again, you seem to be fine. So they lose 4% of GDP, but consumer spending is down four times as much. So when you have these events, people get freaked. It changes their underlying behavior. And you can think about this in terms of let's do a reopening, right? So do you really want to go to a hair salon? Are you really filled with confidence about a giant movie theater? How about getting on that plane that's densified its seats, right? right. Right. So what I'm wondering about is the longer that this goes on, what happens if the underlying behaviors begin to shift, right? right? So that when we come back, what we've built, what we have, our economy, is no longer adapted to the behaviors we actually have as individuals. Is there any 
positive. I mean, it, it always struck me, though, that if we ever could just finally, and, you know, the United States, this seems as far away as ever, but if you actually had a proper social safety net that was fit for purpose in the 21st century, and obviously we want to get out, and I think it's very important that we not used to get used to getting isolated in our homes, but on the other hand, there is the, uh, you know, there is the old ecological, we probably all should consume a bit less, be a le- bit less wasteful type of thing. I mean, is there a scenario in which you could see some of those habits, if they were properly supported by policy, right. setting a new template for how we deal with ecological catastrophe or and so on? Oh, absolutely. But, you know, yeah. the keyword you just threw in there was if we had appropriate policy, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, and yeah. we don't. Um, right. so, so, you know, let's, let's think about what's actually going on, right? right? So the Fed, so the Fed is doing even more than it did in 2008, 2009, right? Done all the swap lines of the central banks, whatever. But it's doing all this stuff that's very hard to understand unless you kind of join the dots a little bit. So what are they doing? They're buying ETFs. They're buying exchange-traded funds. The people that they're doing this with are the people who make them called BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, Right. What else are they doing? They're buying steaming piles of corporate junk. That is to say, in bevest- below investment grade corporate debt. How did we end up with this huge pile of investment grade, sub-investment grade corporate debt? Because the Fed, all the way through from the financial crisis right to the present, kept basically interest rates very, very low. And that meant so long as corporates were in positive growth territory, they could issue tons of debt and do lots of stock buybacks. And now all those debts have gone and went, Urgh! it's the Fed's job to buy them. So what the Fed is doing this time around is way more than 2008. It's basically putting a floor under financial asset prices. Now, what is it the the, the Congress is doing on the Republican side? They're making damn sure that the the financial power of the state is being used to bail out those assets on the other side. So essentially, they shower money on the corporate sector. The Fed puts a, a floor under asset prices. They're all fine. Now, over here, we've got America. American people, they're getting checks. Why are we using checks in the 21st century, right? Well, why are we telling people to go sign on to unemployment systems when we haven't invested in government for over 40 years, tax cut after tax cut after tax cut? So that when people go there, the entire system of Florida's benefits have collapsed, right? Right, literally. That's your problem. Can I imagine a more positive future? Yes, but with an entirely different, if you will, set of institutions for managing growth and managing where the profits go in the economy. Before I want to, I want to loop back to that uh, specifically, but can you actually, I just want you to elaborate on where you were just going over. There was a great piece in the financial times yesterday. And, you know, I guess from my sort of, uh, you know, Marxist reading the financial times perspective, I felt less surprised than they did, but it was a great headline of, Basically, everybody's scratching their chins because the stock market is roaring back and we're in a global depression. I, and, you know, I just wanted to, you know, can that be, I mean, I just outlined a positive potential. That right. could be an extraordinarily negative potential, right? That, that there is the mechanisms to actually keep the system from falling out. But we are concentrating monopolies more than ever. Yeah. We're Five losing... A massive amount of small businesses, which are, in fact, really important, regardless of where you come down politically. It's not just a Republican talking point. Totally. Uh, and, and But you could still actually keep the stock market from falling out. And this might actually be, an, they could look at this as like, oh, that's a fascinating new normal. We could right. have a structural depression in the economy and still and do quite like, well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so part of let's you know let's um, let's dial back the politics for a moment and just think about this as plumbing. Yeah, right? please. So, what is it that the Fed does? The Fed basically is owned by banks and the government to put money through the banking system. That's what it does, right? There's never been a case where the Fed has said we need to give money to people. And given the fact that we've, for the past 30 years, basically been saying that government shouldn't be spending money and it shouldn't be doing all these things or whatever, all of the instruments, all of the plumbing that would enable you to get cash into the real economy of real people have been allowed to basically decay, collapse, or were never built in the first place. Consequently, when you turn on the taps, where does all the water flow? It flows through the Fed into the banking system because that's the world that we've built. 
And the more that the Fed got involved since 2008, the more that it suppressed interest rates, the more that it encouraged a debt, up, a a debt build up on the corporates, the more that, in a sense, they're on the hook for the mess that they've made. So they keep having to do it because if they don't, then that collapses as well. I mean, I guess from the Fed's point of view, what they basically would say is something along the lines of, well, look, all we really can do is put a floor under asset prices. And if we do that, then all we have is an employment crisis. We can then focus and deal with that and bring it back. If they both go down, it's game over for everyone, right? Now, that's a bit like one of those arguments from 2008 about too big to fail, right? right. It may be true, it makes sense, it allows you to go down that path, but it's also extortion. Right. And it's the same sort of game again, right? Essentially, when you think about that, how disgusting is this? We bailed out cruise lines, right? Just stop for a minute. I was talking about the behavioral change, right? Nobody's going on a cruise liner ever again. We should right. scrap those things. Why did we give them billions in bailouts? Possibly because people in Congress and their friends were heavily invested in Carnival and didn't want to lose any money. That's that's when you know you've got these two sides to the story. How do we play it? How are we, how are we pressing that out? And can we, on the small business end, just specifically for a second, if we thought of that as like a third part of of the ways, and let, let we, I think the tap analogy is great. It's set up to save too big to fail, which might actually be just a ridiculous term in and of itself, potentially. I mean, and this actually, let's go on that for a second. Mm -hmm. If you have the capacity to say that you're too big to fail um, and the political clout that goes along with that, might that actually be a signal that, uh, well, at the very least, you could take care of yourself? I mean, it reminded me of Boeing. You know, remember the CEO of Boeing a month ago? Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's what I'd like you to elaborate on. So let's move away from Dennis himself and all the buybacks and all that nonsense, right? Let's just think about the fact that we've got four airlines that run everything. They're all the same. All the prices are the same. They've been making money hand over fist for a decade. And then once they have done the basic investments they, they could, which were heavily levered and funded by debt rather than the free cash flow, they then take the free cash flow to the tune of $48 billion and buy back their own shares because that – alters what's called the earnings per share because it's more concentrated, which makes that metric go up. And that's when a lot of these contracts are remunerated based upon earnings per share, which is part of the reason why Boeing CEO can walk off after causing a complete financialization of the company, whereby making a 737 was important, not because it was a plane somebody was going to use, but because it was an asset you could book so you could then do buybacks. Right. That's what they actually did to the firm, right? Great American company utterly hollowed out from the inside because of this, because of this pathetic behavior. But that type of financialization, unfortunately, has become commonplace everywhere. Right? One of the ones that happened before corona that I was paying attention to, and a few other people were paying attention to, was trailer parks. Now, we don't think of trailer parks as assets, right? But the private equity firms do. So they were basically buying up all these mom and pops and then putting in these management structures, raising the rent and squeezing poor Americans even more and turning the entire sector into yet another asset class. And how does private equity do this? Does it actually come in with money? No, it raises debt, consolidates the companies, puts all the debt on the books of the companies, which means they then have to squeeze everybody. Now, just rinse and repeat and multiply across the whole economy from everywhere from Boeing to trailer parks. And we've just basically turned everything into a financial asset to be juiced, which is why none of us has cash, right? This is why I posted something on Twitter the other week. Um, JP Morgan Research, your average American business has 15 days worth of cash. Why? Because we all assume that there's going to be liquidity. We all assume that tomorrow's going to look like today. We all assume that everything's going to be fine. And if 2008 taught us one thing, that's not true. And we walked right into it again. Only this time, even more of the economy is financialized. Ironically, the banks, because of regulation, are the one bit that hasn't blown up. Everybody else is in free fall. So, yeah, and I was actually even thinking specifically, I think it was the CEO of Boeing who said, I think three or four weeks ago, uh, Maria Bartiromo said, when, when Trump did one of his sort of oh, let me say something at a press conference that actually sounds populist and there won't be any policy follow through. And they were talking for an afternoon news cycle about the idea of uh, basically the U.S. government taking some equity 
if right. we're going to bail everybody out. There should yeah. be some equity and some pretty obvious. And the CEO of Boeing, I, be I believe it was Boeing, said, well, wait a second. I mean, yes, we desperately need help and we're obviously about to collapse and our hands are out. But if you're yeah. going to take equity like that, we certainly have other options. Yeah. Well, Doesn't that show the whole game? Yeah. Exactly. It shows the whole game. So go, go exercise your other options. So a very, well, two interesting things just sticking with airlines. Last week, Mnuchin actually said, you're not getting any money or any more money until we get 10%. So that's actually still alive, even oh. in the US. But the really interesting one is in the UK, where the British Chancellor, the equivalent of the finance minister, has told all of the airlines, go exhaust every other possibility before you come near me. And if you come near me, I'm taking ownership. Yeah. So, you know, you can't do this. It's just a choice. What about the small business component? We've explained you explained really well why the the system is geared towards protecting the financial institutions, and obviously, I think that you know there's a whole other set of stories we could talk about in terms of the decades long attack on organized labor, and we, which you've talked about on this show, and I'd love you to loop back to. But specifically, you know, small business not as something to to romanticize, but at the same time, something I think we need to be real about that this is one of the only vectors left in the economy, that even if you walk around New York City and you think, what is left that's still renting out some floor space that isn't a goddamn Dwayne Reed or Starbucks mm -hmm. might be a decent small restaurant. A third of those right. might not come back. Right. Partly because to go back to that behavioral change, right? Yeah. You open up New York tomorrow, right? Are we going to get together in Brooklyn at that Italian that's down the road from you? Maybe, but maybe not. Whereas before it would be like, totally, let's do this, right? right? Multiply that across the whole economy. So you've got that. But let's think about this in a broader, uh, a broader way, right? So 80 million Americans are hourly workers, right? Some of those are very highly paid, consultants, all the rest of it, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the vast majority are not. They don't have health insurance in many cases. They certainly don't have any statutory sick pay because it doesn't exist in the United States. Now, that's people who work in service industries in general. This is everything from hamburger flippers to massage people to self-employed painters and decorators, et cetera, et cetera, all that sort of stuff. And some of those things are going to not just survive, thrive, right? So if you think about the digital economy, we're able to do this because of the digital infrastructure. Right. If you're part of that space, you go no further than 20% of the stock market is basically five tech firms. You know, Amazon, Apple, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's what, that trend's only going to continue. But let's think about something that like is, is very literally touchy-feely, massage. I mean, after this, are you ever going to get a massage again? Right. It's really open to question, right? right? We well, and even more broadly, I mean, what about going to the gym? I mean, what about things that are more on the border? You know, what about going to a gym? Yep. Working out? What about taking a yoga class? What, I mean... Totally. I mean, what a it? tattoo. I mean, all so right. A, think of this one being in a spinning class when everyone's breathing like they're having a stroke. <laughs> right. And they're yes. being shouted at as well while the music plays. Right. But, but exactly. But all those sort of things. Now, let's think seriously about the sort of the small business predicament. There's actually a buddy of mine who is a kind of banking consultant, and he has been working nonstop for the past four weeks trying to build the plumbing. Because you had the Small Business Administration, which is set up to do very, very few specific things, suddenly being tasked with this giant hose of cash, right? Yeah. Which turns out to be, even though it's giant, it's completely not fit for purpose. It's going to the wrong places. How do you design it so that you can make this thing not just join the SBA, but the SBA actually has enough plumbing to get it out there? And they're doing this, you know, it is actually happening, right? But it's very much a work in progress all the time. And it goes just back to that point. The Fed is set up to give money to primary dealers and large banks. Then they're meant to do the heavy lifting. That works if you have a credit crunch. But what we have is a supply shock, a demand shock, and the sequestering of two-thirds of the labor market. That's not about banks. It's about much, much more fundamental processes. And you see this in the European response. What do you do? You backstop the banks and you say, keep paying wages. Just okay. keep doing it. Pay it at 80%. That's pretty much the response, along with the Germans, shorten the hours, right? And we basically just decided not to do that. It's unemployment plus a check. Well, can you go in deeper into that contrast? And then I want to get to China later. But what, what are the Europeans doing? And maybe the UK is somewhere in the middle uh, 
as distinct from the United States. And, you know, and, and take this as far as you want, but when I look at the bailouts that have passed and everything from just the sort of craven, I mean, you know, one Republican lobbyist was quoted in, I think it was a post piece of saying, hey, when things like this happen, my clients see an extraordinary amount of opportunity and we could take this from, you know, the, the sort of comedic, uh, you know, like Adidas, uh, Adidas wants, uh, you know, they, yeah. they wanted a, some nice goodies to actually incentivize gym memberships, ironically, uh, down to things that are, you know, much, much more craven and much, much more monopoly creating. But can you just contrast the bailout approaches and maybe when you between the Europeans and the United States, and maybe then you can remind us of that story that you've told so well of the broader changes in the political economy in the last couple of decades and why even as Europe has been affected uh, mm -hmm. in the same way, is it just as simple as the fact that they still have some resilient labor power that has not allowed them to go as extremely far as the United States in this kind of just complete consolidation? It is, but it's also broader than just labor. Yeah. Um, it's a very simple way to think about it, shock absorbers. So the, the technical work I've been doing is on something called growth models. And basically, what is that? It's what bit of GDP does a country need to tickle to get growth, right? So if you have Greece, it's basically beaches, because, and that counts as a, a service as export. If you have Germany, it's the auto sector selling cars around the world. So you're export driven, blah, 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 right? Now, Anglo economies are typically consumption driven, very services dependent. And they adjust to shocks basically by not having them or through unemployment and austerity and then bailing out the financial system, right? And then you get that classic V-shaped recovery, right? Europeans are different. Europeans basically, even if their growth comes from exports rather than consumption or whatever, they are open economies uh, to, and therefore big, open economies tend to have bigger welfare states. It's a different type of shock absorber. So even though they've been neoliberalized, even though they've been financialized or whatever, they still have those infrastructures in place, those shock absorbers in the car. That means that the Danish, who are a heavily export dependent country, everything from bacon to high tech components, right? They can turn around and say to everybody, right, everybody at home are gonna pay 80% of wages. Why? Because we have the infrastructure to do that. It's dead easy. We just tell the banks to do it and then we backstop the banks, right? Pretty much all of Europe has that. The big surprise has been Britain. Britain, despite Brexit, is behaving much more like the rest of Europe than it is the United States. The United States really is the outlier on this one. Before we went live, I said, look, the analogy I use for this is comparing a Volvo to a Mustang. Right. So if you allow me to do it again, yes. essentially, like, a Volvo is a nice, powerful car, but it's got a shit ton of airbags, and one of its main claims to fame is if you crash in it, you'll probably live. That's a pretty good example of a sort of dynamic side of the European economy, right? Your northern export countries, big welfare states, but, you know, like that. Now, what's the United States? The United States is basically a 10-year-old Mustang 5-liter GT with this extra supercharger that you've thrown on just for shits and giggles. So long as it's heading in a straight line and so long as all the components are perfectly aligned and everything is working great, it's amazing. The minute it hits a bump in the road, or worse still, a big smacks it into a wall, you're dead. Right? The basic growth model does not allow you to slow down and sequester the economy for six months. There's no equivalent set of institutions that would allow you to work through labor to do what the Germans called Kurzarbeit. You stay at work, but we work with the unions to figure out whose jobs can get cut by how much. Right? There's no equivalent to working through the labor unions in Scandinavia to basically get public support for the lockdown because you're actually still important social institutions. So trust in government tends to be high, which allows you to do these things. We've basically stripped all the airbags out, turbocharged the engine and went Yahoo. Now there's one big airbag at the front, which is basically sort of, you know, what you see with the bailouts and you know who that's for, but everybody else in the back of the car, yeah, you're kind of screwed. What does uh, open economy mean in this context? It means that most of your growth comes from external sources. Okay. Right? That's basically it. You're, you're heavily export dependent. So the technical way to think about it is you basically look at the bit of consumption in the economy that is generated by external sources. And if you look at the United States, we're really only about, depending on you count it, 30% uh, you know, export dependent, let's say, outside. That's what, how much March, right? If you're a small European country like Denmark, it's 100%. Right. 
right? You know, you're living a very, very nice, rich life in Denmark because you're able to sell some really, really impressive shit around the world. If it was just the consumption of Denmark, it would still look like Babette's Feast. <laughs> right. Which is an awesome movie, and I'm glad I managed to throw that reference in there. That was good. That's well done. I know. I know. You, you always like to pop at least one off. So, all right, China. Can you say that again like Trump? China. China, exactly. What does he say? Because it says, me and she have a great relationship. It's yeah. great. And uh, I, I can't imagine how that's possibly true, given the fact that he's abusing him the whole time. Uh, all right, so where do you want to go with China? What do you want to know about China? Well, well, I want to know. Okay, so so I hear so many different. I want. Well, I want to just focus very specifically. Okay, two things. So one is: is there a meaningful difference between a managed capitalism, which could still fit into a larger socialist uh, sort of game plan? That's the question, I guess, that people are kind of interested in around these parts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you know, particularly in how they want to come down on on the Chinese model overall. But mm -hmm. more more specifically, China's contracted the most, I think, in the last quarter uh, since it has since 1992. Yeah, obviously, it's facing real challenges. On the other hand, I mean, it's sitting there. It's it, it can take advantage of enormously cheap oil from Saudi Arabia. And they might be on a faster timeline than certainly the United States and maybe the Europeans. So there's just, yeah. just overall reinforced China's growth arc or at the other, they had a major public health crisis and they suppressed information and they, you know, and it, and it traveled the world. Is this a setback? I mean, what, how should we be looking at this? So a lot of big questions. Of big here's, questions. Here's, how I, here's how I try and think about it. Um, let's think about China's growth, right? So for the longest time, China was a giant export platform for American and other multinationals. That started to change over 10 years ago. It's still export dependent and about a third of its growth depends upon exports, but it's way down from where it was. Also a decade ago, there was much, much more saving in the economy because it was an economy in transition. It may be communist in name, but it had no socialist institutions to protect people. You're pretty much on your own. And because of that, there's a very high rate of savings. What China has been trying to do for the past 12 years, with a reasonable degree of success, is make the economy much, much more connected and consumption dependent. Now, one of their greatest weaknesses is they don't have the dollar. We do. And therefore, they have capital controls, which means the capital can come in, but it can't easily leave the country. In 2015, there was a bit of loosening of those controls and nearly a trillion dollars left the country. And this is part of what brought Xi to be the Xi that he is today. Because what that signaled was the entire Chinese investor class would rather live in Malibu than anywhere in China. And if you open it up, they're gone, right? But when you close that down, there's nowhere else for that capital to go except stay in China and circulate in China, right? And China's a big, big, bloody economy. So in a way, if they turn inwards, because they're, they're kind of open to the outside on their terms, but protected on their terms, it's a bit of the analogy would be like the United States in the New Deal period. You go off of gold, right? You focus on domestic consumption, and you basically power your own growth, and then you worry about the rest of the world later. My sense is that's what China is going to try and do. Now, it can do that, again, because, if you will, its growth model, how it grows is under the control of a very large state apparatus. It has the Communist Party to call on. So let's think about what the Communist Party does. I mean, when you lock down a whole city and you have to organize food distribution, basically takeout for like 4 million people, who do you think's doing the delivery? It's not Deliveroo, it's the Communist Party, right? So they're able to basically energize their cadres and get these things going and it's a campaign and we're gonna do this. And whether you like it or not as an individual, it's completely irrelevant. The fact is, we can't get enough testers. Right. They don't have a problem with testers, right? So there's a lot of resilience in that model, even if there's a lot of problems with it, right? What's the, the American response to this? Well, it's been on the downhill for a long time, as we know, for, for multiple reasons. And to a certain extent, even if Biden was president tomorrow, you're not going back to the type of relationship that China had with Obama. But there is something peculiar about this particular moment when you've got Pompeo basically jumping up every day and shouting about China and the conspiracy theory of the lab and the virus and the whole nine yards. That This is blame avoidance on an epic scale. So, you know, I imagine China looking at this going, look, we've all got troubles. 
we could either be cooperative or we can be horrible about each other. If we're horrible, you're just calling me names. It doesn't really matter. I'll just get on with my own shit. What are you right. going to do? Right? And it seems that our main thing is to shout out China. And that's just because of the complete failure of, right. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, think about it, though. I mean, this predates Trump. This is not just about his management style. Right. I mean, the American healthcare system is an incredible disaster. I'm yeah, I mean, can you talk about that? I mean, because it also strikes me that, you know, just as we could acknowledge some of the successes of China, we also could, I mean, everybody wants to talk about South Korea. That's the big NPR place, but they don't want to also acknowledge mm -hmm. the fact that Bernie Sanders was the only one remotely approximating the healthcare system like South Korea. So, yeah. I mean, that's no, the other I'm one you have to put into the mix, right? Is just the unique disaster of the American healthcare system. So I've got a piece up on foreignaffairs.com that touches on this. And I've got another one coming out in foreign policy sometime next week that's about this specific issue. It's like, look, if you want to design a set of institutions which are optimized to not produce healthcare but to produce profits and vulnerabilities, we built it. Congratulations, right? right. So uh, you know, the, the point of the insurers is not to insure, it's to avoid risk, right? The point of the hospital is not to buy public health, it's to employ doctors and nurses to do elective procedures to make profits, right? The number one um, specialty uh, of doctors is dermatology, right? Because you get to do nose jobs, right? So, you know, just add in how much money it costs to go to graduate school, to be a doctor, the catastrophic insurance, et cetera, et cetera. This thing is not geared towards public health at all. Now, you wanted a, a silver lining. A silver lining could be this. Just as only Nixon could go to China, Trump might be the one, as a, as a play, if this goes really bad, to try and really socialize medicine. Because all of those insurers are going to be broke if this continues. All those hospitals are going to be getting bailed out by the government anyway. Isn't that already, they're already indicating, I mean, that's the big Pelosi yeah. plan so far is a big bailout for the insurance companies. Now, I get what you're saying about Trump, and I understand, I mean, he even already said that a couple of weeks ago. He goes, you know, it doesn't seem fair. But at the same time, you know, he says these things occasionally, yeah. but, the, sure. but the Republican Party is it, just, you know, like many Democrats, is owned essentially by his interests. So, I mean, is that what we're in store for, a big insurance company bailout? Well, it could be, but you know, the thing yeah. is, if you bail them out, the only way it works is if they start to get premiums in. And they get premiums in because people are paying premiums because they're in employment, right? And if you've got 30% unemployment, there's no functional model that the insurers can have. You literally can't use that model anymore. It's done, right? So right. think, you know, other countries have private bits of their healthcare service, right? The Dutch have it, the Germans have it, whatever. But here, it's pretty much all of it. And the problem is, what are your incentives as a hospital when you get hit with COVID? You fire doctors and nurses, and then you concentrate on one thing and make a loss, right? So th whoever is in charge, the American healthcare system, but after one, one year from now, is going to be in such a terrible state that a massive rebuild is going to have to happen. And that one way or another is going to be done by the state. So you could do the shittiest possible version of this, which is, let's just bail out the insurers. Because six months later, you'll be bailing them out again. Or you can actually face the fact that this is a ridiculous version of a healthcare system. Every other developed democracy has some kind of single-payer platform. Why don't we just join the club? It's so much easier. Um, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's just so hard to imagine, frankly, Trump or Biden's uh, coalitions making that, you know, making that pivot. But I... I mean, of course. I can imagine Biden doing it. I mean, if Biden wants to get any Good. of the Bernie supporters yeah. on board, this is the number one play you make. Well, and absolutely. It yeah. hasn't done it yet, though. <laughs> right. But, yeah. you have, I mean, it's the usual thing. You have to wait until things get really bad before they'll do it. Right. 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 So we have to, we have to, I see. We have to, it's like, well, we haven't seen a real crisis yet. You have to wait until Johns Hopkins University Hospital goes bankrupt. And then they're like, all right, okay, done. Now we have to do something. Right. Then, then, then all of a sudden, single payer is is very reasonable. That the other day, I was watching a clip of a Scottish person who has wielded more power than you have, but he's a lot less charismatic. Uh, the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown. Oh yes, was, yes, was talking. About, <laughs> he said, "Did you ever meet Gordon?" I have met Gordon a couple. I've yeah, got a really okay. funny story about Gordon actually. Yeah, but, I have, you know, you know what? Know, my into it. I would like to know. Of course. <laughs> so he was talking about the uh, 
the the global south dimension for lack of a better yeah. word we've already talked about uh you know grace blakely and i talked about the need essentially for a massive uh debt relief package and how this is going to roll into latin america and parts of africa um and then as gordon brown was saying it i think with the hopes of sort of a- appealing to some of the selfishness of the christian amen poor audience that in addition to it being the right thing to do, that if we don't have a strategy in place, then it's just going to recirculate back from the periphery into the center through air travel. Um, and again, you know, it seems like another thing that just seems so out of bounds with the sort of America first, China first, India first, uh, you know, uh, conversation we have right now. But there needs yeah. to be a plan. And I and I'm, yeah, I'm just curious your your, your thoughts on that dimension as well. So, you know, internationalism gets a bad rap, but, you know, it's, it's, there's two things. You, you mentioned it earlier on, the first one being climate change. And my one and only line on climate change I like to use is a recycled Greta Thunberg line. You're arguing against physics. Physics right, right. doesn't care, right? And I think you can do exactly the same thing with the wor- an interconnected world under a pandemic. Right? You're arguing against biology. It really doesn't care. So either you adapt yourself to that mentality and then you cooperate on whatever level that means, or you, you, know, you, die, you die singly. It's as simple as that. Now, you know, to a certain extent, can you insulate yourself by closing off your borders and all the rest of it? Yeah, absolutely. But let's think about you know, Europe as an example of this. Europe tries to close its borders and basically people walk from Syria and end up in Turkey and Erdogan uses them as a weapon to extract concessions from the Europeans. Shutting yourself off doesn't seem to be a very successful route. Right. So, you know, uh, Gordon is quite correct on this, but unfortunately, you know, the biggest failure we have is a failure of imagination. And you have to imagine that this is possible. Does, is there a, you, you've talked to me in the past, actually, though, about this idea of, of sort of, 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 having basically, if I read you correctly, some type of social democratic or renewed left-wing version of a vision for the nation state. Because at mm-hmm. the same time, we're we're in an era where the, you know, internationalism is profoundly needed. And then at the same time, clearly, I mean, how much can you kind of swim against stream in terms of what people want? You also need to have a compelling alternative to the poison of vandalism, not just the lecture on why people shouldn't want those yeah, things. I totally yeah, I totally agree. Absolutely. I mean, to me, you know, the, the, the big problem, Danny Roderick said this, loads of people have said this, the problem is democracy stops at the boundaries of the nation state, whereas right. capital, capitalism doesn't. Now, either you basically make the borders of capitalism and democracy more congruent, or you internationalize democracy. Right. We can't internationalize democracy. It doesn't work. It turns into shitty-ass technocracy, ask the EU, right? And that's with the best case possible. Or alternatively, you have to basically rein it in. Now, are we going to rein it in? I think we're already seeing it being reined in. But we're going to see it in for weird reasons. So let's think about this one. There's a prosciutto factory in Rhode Island that just had 80 uh, COVID cases. So they'll be shutting that place down and, you know, God knows when it'll open. The entire protein production process of the United States is completely compromised because our hypocrisy over migration is such that we absolutely, if you want to define an essential worker, try somebody who picks food out of the fields or slaughters your cows and your chickens, right? And it turns out loads of them are undocumented. So we want to throw them all out, even though they're the ones that keep you fed, right? So all of these places are incredible, like lack of social distance and terrible conditions, whatever. So guess what? North Dakota, other places, all these plants are going to shut down. So we've got real problems with the American food chain. This has nothing to do with globalism or globalization, right? But what are you going to do in, 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 as a result of this? You're going to automate the shit out of that process. This is going to go with a huge spark to automation. And what that's also going to do is going to go with a huge spark to basically bringing things back home to a more localized production network. The medical crisis is a great example of this. 90% of America's masks are made abroad. 80% of our, I mean, the fact that all the big pharma companies are nominally American unless they move to Europe for tax inversion reasons, right? Which a few of them have. The 80% of our pharmaceuticals come from abroad, yet we pay the highest pharmaceutical prices in the world. So when I say the borders of capitalism and democracy need to be congruent, that's a good example. Why are we paying more than anybody else for drugs that are being made abroad by American firms. That's just off. 
So that's what needs to be made congruent. So, and also I like nations for another reason, not nationalism, but nations. When you, when you have one big plan and you execute it, if it doesn't work, you're all screwed. Think, right. for example, Copenhagen. Everybody gets together, drink champagne. Yeah, we're going to do loads of stuff on climate. They all go home. Once the champagne's done, nothing happens, right? No enforcement mechanism, right? When you have lots of different states that are able to do lots and lots of different things, you get experiments. And you go, well, that was not exactly what not to do. I mean, I look at the American healthcare system as an example of what not to do, right? right. And then I look somewhere else and I go, oh, that's kind of interesting. Imagine doing that. And through that process of kind of copying what works, that's a different form of bottom-up internationalism and cooperation rather than the kind of top-down technocratic Davos bullshit version that we've been fed for the past 20 years. Yeah, and that creates more resiliency. I mean, I've been thinking of just as a framework. I don't know, you know, I, I could think of some examples, obviously, to the extent that labor has the capacity to coordinate across borders that's fantastic. Obviously, people, you know, uh, collaborating in business and political movements and, and, and you know, the, the positive sides of globalization mm -hmm. that we're missing right now, okay? The, you know, the, the capacity to travel, whatever. And then this idea that you would have a much more an empowered nation state, not to deliver xenophobia and nationalism, but essentially to deliver a proper social democracy, which mm -hmm. everybody seems to sort of be struggling for some version of. And then actually also, you know, this takes me back to the, the 70s books of like E.F. Schumacher, but like the idea of some localism on certain things like right. agriculture and, and, and other maybe even uh, regional energy systems. And then maybe, I, do you like that framework of a sort of global interdependence, national different versions of social democracy with some some localism as well for even yeah, more absolutely. experimentation. Yeah. And I, I, I like the redundancy that's built into it. I mean, to go back to the banking example, right? We built a global economy that's collectively too big to fail and too big to build. There's no redundancies. Once it breaks, the whole thing breaks, right? Causes untold damage, right? What about having, let's think about energy production. Rather than doing it the way we do now, um, the, the word annoys me because it makes it sound worse than it is, but community solar. Right? right, you can basically scale this up and switch it on and switch it off and have redundant capacity, etc. You could read 30% of all the emissions in the United States come from buildings. The big problem in doing it is basically the codes vary so much, and then what do you do to meet code to get up whatever? But these are technical problems that could be solved. If you were to invest in retrofitting those buildings to make them carbon neutral and scaled up solar at the same time and kept control at the local area then you'd have redundancy in your system. You wouldn't have big outages anymore. You could switch it on, switch it off, right? So there's loads of ways in which local and adaptability leads to my, one of my favorite books, Nassim Taleb's Anti-Fragile, right? Right. right? It's not about being resilient. Resilient is I punch you in the head and you still stand up long enough to punch me back. That's not good, right? <laughs> what he's talking about is anti-fragility. Systems whereby when you get a shock, the whole system adapts to it, learns from it, and moves on. Right, and that's the thing. and whether we call that social democracy or whatever, one whereby there are safety nets that people occasionally access that don't throw them out on the trash heap, that isn't asymmetrically paid off to already the people who already have everything, where everybody pays taxes, where everybody works meaningfully, and most of the time we don't need these institutions. It's like the airbags in the Volvo. Most of the time you don't drive with the airbags. You don't even think about the airbags, but you're very grateful when you have that crash. Right, right. So, I mean, is, is there any is there any in the United States? I'm going to ask you for one more silver lining. Is there anything that is emerging right now on a policy or any type of level that you think is even getting us one percent in the right direction at the moment? Well, I think that you're going to have to fix the healthcare system and, and fundamentally fix yes. it because your insurance based model is done in private. You know. You, you get it through your employer. Everybody's unemployed. Like, you, you know, you've taken the Obama problem of 27 million post-Obamacare and basically now made this 80 million, right? It's, it's, right? it's insane, right? That's got to go, right? Other ones going forward, sadly not that many because in a sense, to go back to one of the first questions we mentioned but we didn't really tackle, let, let's do this in closing, is, you know, what's my thoughts about opening and closing? I think we're going to do a lot of it. 
And we're going to do a lot of it because given the way the U.S. growth model is configured, people absolutely have to get to back, to get back to work. Now, look at the Michigan protest. There was two very important pictures of that protest. One was all the guys with beards and AR-15s. Right. And all that. But they were not the majority. It was the people in the governor's mansion with their faces pressed up against the glass who were basically sort of like lower middle class white Americans, right? They're desperate. We know this strat. We've heard it 100,000 times by now. 40% of all Americans would have trouble getting 400 bucks together in an emergency. The emergency started four weeks ago. That 400 bucks is gone. Millions of people in this. Look at the food bank lines, for God's sake. Five miles in some places, right? This place is in crisis point, and we're still kind of behaving as if it's okay, and we'll be getting back to work soon, right? So unfortunately, I think what has to happen is we're going to try, particularly amongst those states that are less, um, let's say, less acceptance of a lockdown model to get back to work. And what will happen is one of two things. Either we're going to get super lucky. It turns out antibodies do give protection. Way more of us have been infected than we thought possible. And then these states lead the way and we're actually great. And in which case, you know, more fool me, they're the ones that were right. Or the horrible alternative, which is they take their already under pressure health systems that are poorly funded that had, in the case of Texas, 18% of people without, 18% of people without health care going into the crisis, let alone now. And you're going to basically boom-bust cycle that thing three or four times as you try and restart the engine of the Mustang. Right. So, and it's, so I've got a piece up on foreign affairs called Why America is Uniquely Vulnerable to Coronavirus that lays this out. And my fear is that we have to basically try and, we crash the Mustang, and we try and restart the engine three or four times before we realize we need to build a Volvo. Let's build that Volvo. Let's build a 1980s I'm all for it. boring box and have a decent life. Mark Blythe, you'll tell me that Gordon Brown story soon. Uh, I, we, we appreciate you very much. And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll reread Anti-Fragile. Yeah, do it. It's actually worth it. It's one of those ones that's better the second time around. Great. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. Everybody, if you're watching, you haven't subscribed yet, do so. Appreciate all of you. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy, be well.